Hey everyone, this is Charles Mitri from loungeboudoir.com and today I'm going to talk to you about 11 critical mistakes beginning boudoir photographers make. Number one, not having a signed contract. Now, whether you're getting paid or you're doing a trade shoot or some type of session waiver for a promotional shoot, you want to have a signed contract or agreement. It just sets up, sets up expectations between you and your client. It lets everybody know what is being offered and for how much and for the amount of time that that's going to be offered. So not having a signed contract can get you into trouble if there's a dispute about something. I mean, most contracts cover just about everything you can think of with regard to a shoot. Um, I have three that I use. I use one for my fully paid, paid clients. I have one that I use for T4P for um, and I have one for promotional uh, situations where part of the fee is waived for the session and then, then they pay for their products later. So I have three different types of contracts and or agreements. They all state what you're getting, what the client is getting for the amount of money that they're, that they're paying or not paying. Number two, not making it clear that photos are not included with their session fee. So the way a lot of boudoir photographers are set up is they charge, let's say, three, four, five hundred dollars for a session fee where they take the photos and then they have a, an order session where the client orders the product where they pay for them separately. So you want to make sure that the client understands that there are no images included in their session fee. Now I have this written at some point in my contract. I actually have it written three different times at three different places to emphasize that fact. Um, I will also tell them over the phone in a pre-consultation when we're getting down to payment and such I, I will re-emphasize that now you're aware that there are no images included in the session fee. Um, this fee is just for the, the photo shoot itself, and then there'll be another opportunity to order product separately. So you want to make that very clear with them. Now you can get into trouble with this if you are running some type of promotion where you've waived your, your fee, but you're still charging for product. You don't want to advertise or mislead the client into thinking that, wow, I'm getting this, this shoot for free I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and I'm going to get these images. That's where you can get into trouble. So make sure that they know exactly what they're getting or what they're not getting with that session fee. Number three is not having a game plan for their shoot. When you're talking with your client on the phone, sort of in a pre-consultation, what I, what I like to do is, during the course of the conversation, ask them, is there any, um, anything you don't want featured in the images or de-emphasized? And also, is there any, anything like regarding your body that you do want emphasized and that you want to make sure that we do get? So when they tell you these things, or if there are any, there may not be anything at all, some people might have one thing they're self-conscious about that they don't really want featured. You need to write that down and remember that. So that's part of your game plan when you go into the, the shoot itself. You don't want to forget about these things. The client won't. And you want to make sure that you either capture what they asked for and not emphasize what they didn't want emphasize. That will make them more likely to buy more photos. Number four is not having a posing guide handy. Now I've talked about this before in a previous video and I continue to emphasize it time and time again because posing is such a critical part of pulling off a successful boudoir shoot. It's, it, it's so important. I can't emphasize it enough. So when you're starting out, you have a lot of things running through your head the particulars of a certain pose or even the variety of poses you want to try and capture might slip your mind. That's why it's good to have images on your phone that you can refer to 
or in a binder or something that you can look at yourself and also show your client exactly what you're going for. So have a posing guide handy so you don't forget anything. Number five, a critical mistake is not easing into the shoot. What I like to do is start off with them pretty much fully clothed. I like to have my first series of, of shots be in jeans and some type of top where the woman then is kind of revealing a hint of undergarment and some skin and it kind of gets them used to being in front of the camera. It gets them used to working with you and you working with them and them taking directions and then they're, they don't feel so vulnerable. They don't have to think about, oh my God, I'm, you know, I can't believe I'm stripping in front of this person and they're taking pictures of me because they're really not. They're only doing it very minimally. So that kind of breaks the ice with them getting in front of the camera and it, it helps to ease them into the next series, which will be more revealing. I also like this method because it allows for a progression of images. If they're having an album and they start off sort of fully clothed and then they get um, reve more revealing and the poses get a little more risque as the session goes on. So there's a nice progression of, of images that they can have in an album. So make sure you sort of ease your client into the shoot. Number six is not take, not not taking advantage of the, the variation you can get from one pose. When you're posing someone, make sure, if you can remember, you might want to write this down, to capture that pose with, at various distances, maybe wide, medium, close up, also different angles and different lenses if you have them. You might capture one particular pose with a 50 millimeter lens mid range. And then you put on a 35 millimeter lens to get sort of a wider shot. So there are a lot of varieties, a lot of variety, a huge variety of images you can get from just changing angles, changing distances and changing lenses. Number seven is, this is more of a cropping framing uh, problem. Don't amputate your client. What that means is don't cut off limbs, arms, hands in the framing of your shot. Now there is an exception to this. And there are exceptions to this rule. If you have your client up against the wall, let's say she's standing in a pose and you're, you're using a 50 millimeter lens, you're not far enough back where you capture her whole image. Where you do crop them is sort of just below mid thigh. You don't want to crop, crop. You don't want to frame the shot or crop at the kneecaps. That would be a joint and that's going to look weird. So you come up about three or four inches from the kneecap and you can frame the bottom of your frame to cut her off there, capturing the rest of her body. And that's true also if she's lying down. So just remember, you don't want to crop off any arms or legs at the joints, at the wrists, that looks really weird. If you have to crop and frame, do it above the joint, below the joint. So there is that. Now there's an addendum to that and that's you don't want to, you don't want to impale your client either. And what I mean by that is you don't want anything in the background that appears to be sticking into them or impaling them. Let's say they're lying down on the ground and there happens to be, for whatever reason, <laughs> a broom in the background, a broom handle. You don't want that broom handle appearing to be impaling her while she's on the ground. God, my mouth is so dry. Get some water. Okay, I'm back. I was talking about you don't want to impale your clients with anything in the background that could appear to be sticking out of them. All right, moving on to number eight, trying to do too much in the allotted time that you're given. So you only have so much time that you've agreed upon to shoot your client in, whether it's an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, anywhere in there. Uh, don't try to do too much. 
what you want to do is prioritize, if you can, the shots that you definitely want to get towards the front of your shoot, at least within the first hour. Let's say you're shooting for an hour and a half. You want to get as much of the critical stuff done in the first 45 minutes to an hour and save the less prioritized shots near the end. Because I, there was a situation I was in once, maybe twice, where the client took an unusually long time changing, twice. So let's say she took anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes changing outfits for whatever reason. You do that twice, she does that twice, that's 20 to 30 minutes of your, of your time gone, of her time gone. So if you get in a situation like that, you don't want to have to rush to get critical stuff that you didn't get at the beginning towards the end of your shoot. You may have rented a studio and you may not be able to extend that time. There may be someone coming in after you. So prioritize your, your shots as, you know, as best you can with easing the client into the shoot and get most of your critical stuff done within the first 45 minutes. Okay. Number nine is not securing your client's gallery. Now this pertains to galleries that are online. In an ideal world, you would never put a client gallery online, but I know a lot of boudoir photographers do, I do. Sometimes you're in situations you just, they just can't come in and look at their photos for whatever reason. Maybe they've traveled a long distance or they just have other commitments. So you wanna make sure that you use a password protected gallery. There's a lot of different ones out there. I happen to use CloudSpot, which uh, has a password protected gallery. And I, I, they're very cheap. I think they're, they're, they're really good. I haven't had any problems with them. You can uh, brand your, your own site there. Uh, let's see, number 10 is not having sample products. So there's a saying, I say so a lot, I realize that. I'm trying not to, I'm trying to stop. Number 10, not having sample products. You sell what you show. You wanna have the albums that you're selling physically that, that you can hand to your client that they can look at, they can feel, they can compare different sizes with. If you sell a lot of products, that's gonna be very difficult. I don't personally encourage people to do that. I have a very narrow range of products that I sell. I sell three different albums, three different metal prints, three different fine art prints, and digitals, that's it. And the metal prints and the fine art prints are the same size, three different sizes. That's, that's enough to, um, that's not too overwhelming. The reason you don't want to have a lot of products is you would have to have a lot of them on hand to show the client. And also it can, it can be confusing for the client and a confused mind does not buy. So I've been told, and I, and I believe that coming from people who study selling and things like that. So have sample products on hand that your clients can touch and feel and look at. And number 11, taking too long to process images and orders. There is a certain momentum of a whole client experience from contacting you to the pre-consultation, to the shoot, to viewing the images, to getting her images. And you wanna kinda of keep that momentum going. You wanna keep that enthusiasm bubbling for a number of reasons. Uh, one is you're hoping to get a nice uh, review that they can write and provide you with. Another thing is you never know what's gonna pop up in your life where, where if you hold off processing images, let's say because you wanted to do this, you wanted to do that, that wasn't really necessary for you to do, and you hold off processing someone's images, something in your life could, could, could pop up 
that would delay you even more. Now they're waiting even longer for you to finish processing their images and getting their order in. So get things done in, a, in, a, in as timely a manner as you can. And the client will appreciate it. What you want to do is, what's that saying? You want to under promise and over deliver. So you might say, well, it'll take three weeks to get the order when you know it'll probably take maybe 12 days or even less than that. And then the client is pleasantly surprised. You look good. They're impressed with how you've handled everything. And everything works out. Wrapping this up, those are the 11 critical mistakes that beginning boudoir photographers can make. And also, if you're not a beginning boudoir photographer, just at any, at any part of the journey that you're on in becoming a boudoir photographer, these things can, can trip you up. I'll do a short review of all of them. So number one, not having a signed contract. Number two, not making it clear that photos are not included with the session fee. Number three, not having a game plan for their shoot. Number four, not having a posing guide handy. Number five is not easing into the shoot. Number six is not utilizing a variety of poses, a variety of shots with one pose, fully utilizing one pose. Number seven, avoid amputating and impaling your client through cropping and framing. Number eight is trying to do too much in the allotted time given. Number nine, number nine, number nine, not securing your client's gallery properly with password and encryption. Number 10, not having sample products. <laughs> oh my God. Not having sample products for them to touch and feel. And number 11 is taking too long to process their order. And we are done. That's it. You can go play now. Thank you for watching. I appreciate your time. Hit that like button and subscribe button. <laughs> <coughs> My throat is so dry. Thank you. appreciate you. Check out loungeboudoir.com and I will see you at a future point in the YouTube universe.